Okay. Okay. I, I think I will start with the class now. Okay, so last class, what did we learn? Can any one of you just recapitulate for me in brief, just in one or two lines? What did we learn during the last class? What did we learn during the last class? Yes, teacher. In constancy, in contract, and verbus contract. Okay. okay. Yeah, we learned the consent when the party has entered in the contract, it must be in their cont in consent. This is an important element of the contract. Very good. Very good. So we have finished up with consent that must be without any coercion, without any duress, without any misrepresentation, and the consent should be a free consent, and the parties must have consensus ad idem. That means meeting of minds. See, this is a key word. The parties must have consensus ad idem. That means meeting of minds. Are you understanding me? So, for a contract to be valid, again, one of the essential element is there must be a free consent. The consent must be free. Parties must have consensus added in meeting of minds, and it must be free of misrepresentation, duress, coercion, and so on. So today we are going to learn about termination of contracts or discharge of contracts how a contract is discharged, how a contract is terminated. Now, obviously, like we, before we go through our slides, you just try to apply your mind. Let me begin with a simple example. Um, I contract with Naima saying that, Naima, I will sell you my phone. I give my phone to Naima and say, I'm willing to sell you this phone. And Naima says, yes, I'm willing to purchase it. She asks me, what is the price of it? Then I say, the price of it is whatever amount, X amount. Okay, figure. Just let's say, you know, give it an expression X. Say X amount. So then Naima says, well, I'm happy to receive this. Um, I'm ready to pay you that amount. So Naima immediately puts hand in a pocket and she removes it and she gives it to me and I hand over the phone. And what happens here? The dealing is finished. So here, without even studying anything, the thing that has to come to your mind is the contract is terminated or is discharged. The contract is discharged or the contract is also terminated the moment the transaction for what is contracted gets over. The contract is discharged upon performance of the contractual obligation to the fullest. Now, in this, I pay, I, I give the product, she pays me the price consideration, and it's done. You understand? So, contract is this is just a simple example. So, what I'm trying to say is the moment performance is or whatever is the contractual obligations, those contractual obligations are completed are well performed. It's one of the ways that contract is discharged and contract gets completed. Next is, suppose the contract is impossible to be performed. Let me give you another example, a simple example. Say that um, uh, Kasim has a house or Abdul Kader has a house uh, at the side of the sea and uh, he desires to sell it to Abdullahi. And uh, they both have a meeting and uh, Abdullah, he says, wow, your house is beautiful. Uh, is this your kind of an, a kind of, uh, you know, a holiday home that you have? And he says, yes, yes, but I'm not interested because it's really costing me a lot to maintain the house and I'm not available in the city, blah, 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 whatever reasons we give. So Abdullah, he says that, yes, I'm, well, so why I'm ready to maintain, I'm willing to purchase this house. What is the price of it? Then uh, Kasim gives the amount or, you know, 
of the Kadir Yasin gives the amount of the, uh, the house and then they both get together, they strike a deal, they agree with each other, now comes the enforceability part of it, they say, okay, let us, uh, you know, uh, get with each other, have an agreement for sale, and then after that, I pay you the token amount, whatever, and then after that, they sign a sale deed, and it's finished. So now here, again, with this example, the contract gets over, is discharged the moment the sale transaction is finished. Now, let us move a little bit further, stretch our imagination again and say that I said the house is beside a sea. Okay. There is another person. Let us give another example. So there's another person, Mr. X and his house is by the sea again, a stretch of imagination, imagination and uh, Y is agreed to purchase the house of C of X. Sorry. And uh, now what happens? There is a tsunami. There is a tsunami and, you know, Y has paid part amount, part payment. He has made part payment. And now there is a tsunami and the house is destroyed. Now what happens? Now here, contract is discharged and automatically terminated because the subject matter of the contract, that is the house itself is destroyed by tsunami. So it is it would say that the contract is frustrated and impossible to be performed. You understanding me? Because the subject matter is on there. The house is destroyed. The contract was relating to the house. The house is destroyed. So now what are you going to sell? Now what the question is, what would happen to the amount that was part, partly paid? The person has to give it back. You have to give back the amount because the house is destroyed. Are you understanding me? So contract is discharged also by you know, by frustration of the subject matter, or its contract is said to be frustrated because of impossibility of performance. A contracts with, or A agrees with B. A says, I will marry you, B. B dies. So the contract, impossibility of performing it. That's one way of discharging the contract. Again, yet another way is by operation of law. In case there are any changes in the law, if the government says, suddenly a government comes up with a kind of a law saying that this should be done or this should not be done. And if it affects the material part of the contract, again, contract gets discharged, contract gets terminated. These are some of the ways by performance, by operation of law, or by impossibility to perform the contract. So these are some of the ways a contract is discharged. And again, breach of contract. Breach of contract is something where either of the parties, you know, they move away. That is, they break the contract terms. They move away from the essence of the contract, from the promise that they have made. They move away from the essence of the contract. They breach the contract. So in contractual language or in contract law, we call it as a breach. Breach is to go against the terms of the contract or to break the promise, simple terms simple words, breaking the promise in the contract. So in law, we call it as breach of contractual terms or breach of contract. So when there is a breach of contract, now what will happen? Again, there is a possibility of uh, the contract either being, you know, uh, terminated or there is a possibility that the person can go to the court and ask, bring an order saying, let the other person fulfill the terms of the contract. So this, now from here, we are going to the remedy in case of breach. In case of breach, the remedy is you knock the doors of the court and ask the court, please issue me an order and just ask this person to complete his part of contract, please. Okay, one. Second thing is, okay, there's already damage cause, so pay me compensation. So damages. Are you understanding me? So this is just the crux in simple words I've just explained to you in a very lay language you know, without comp using complicating terms, uh, complicated terms, what is, uh, you know, how a contract is terminated and, and uh, uh, what happens when there is a breach? What is a remedy in case of breach? Like damages, you claim damages or you ask the court, bring the court's orders saying that please ask the other person to perform their part of the contract. Now let us go through our slides. So this is what we are going to learn today.
I'm sure you can see the screen. Yes. Thank you for confirming. Okay, so discharge of contracts or termination of contracts. Now, a contract is said to be discharged or terminated when contractual obligations cease. That means they come to an end and the contract comes to an end. So I'm repeating, a contract is said to be discharged or terminated when contractual obligations cease or the contract comes to an end. A contract may be terminated, discharged under the following circumstances. So this is important. So what are the circumstances under which a contract is terminated? One is discharge by performance. That is termination when the object of the contract is fulfilled. I told you about, uh, you know, the sale transaction of my phone between me and Naima. Next is discharge of contract if a substantial agreement is executed. Suppose there is a change in contractual terms and they say that, uh, let us not see, change in contractual terms, now just for you to know, can be done in two ways. They can bring about an amendment to the same agreement and then add maybe an annexure to it or just amend the contract and add an addendum or an annexure to it. Or they would say if the main, you know, the main essence of the essence of the contract, uh, th there are some amendments or changes to that, then they will ask for a substituted contract. They'll ask for an entirely new contract. So the old contract, the parties decide among themselves mutually, no, we will not proceed with that. With that, we will go ahead with a new, new contract, whatever we have decided, the terms that we have decided, and they will execute a new contract, the oldest, and you know, they, they set it aside. So the old, so a contract is terminated when, if there is substituted agreement, and if there is an amendment to the contract and a substituted agreement, a new agreement to that effect. Next is termination upon completion of the terms of the contract or even discharge by lapse of time. In case a contract is confined with, with uh, that it has to be performed within a particular time limit. That means if the time limit you know, if, the, if the, the time period within which it has to be performed, it lapses. That means the contract gets terminated. Next is termination under the operation of law. I said, for example, if the government comes up with a new rule or, you know, by operation of law, say, for example, uh, companies, there are two companies, company A and company B, they merge with each other under merger, acquisition. So by operation of law. Depending upon what type of agreement it is, there is a possibility in case of mergers and acquisition of companies that term, uh, a contract can be terminated under operation of law. Let me give you a simple example here. For example, sometimes it happens when a company is acquired by a new company, that is acquisition of companies and company law. In this case, the question comes is what about the employees? Normally what would happen is the, the employees, employees also would be transferred to the, the new newly formed uh, the company which is you know acquiring this company and they're either taking a new name or they're having a merged name or whatever or entirely their name the 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 company which is taking over so the, what happens to the employees employees also would be transferred to the company which has you know acquired the old company or the company uh, whatever existing company they acquire it sometimes it may happen that see we, we already have companies uh, i mean employees of our own and I do not want to take any new uh, employees. So they might try to, you know, cut out and uh, uh, cut out some of the employees and so on. So the employment contracts with some of them may be terminated, you know, understanding. So this is kind of a simple example. Again, is by operation of law. Another example would be by bankruptcy or, or of a particular party, if it is an individual contract or if it is a con corporate contract by the insolvency of the company. In case the company is declared insolvent, then what happens automatically by operation of law, you know, uh, you know, contracts which there may be there, uh, which has been transacted by the companies, you know, it can come to an end. Next is termination in case the purpose is rendered infructuous or discharged by, uh, you know, infructuous is fruitless. It cannot happen now. Discharged by frustration or, you know, supervening impossibility or impossibility of performance. You call it termination by supervening impossibility or discharge by frustration or impossibility of performance. I gave you an example where I said that Qasim wants to, Abdushan Abdul Qasim wants, Yasin wants to sell the house to Abdullahi, which is on the side of the sea. Example. I gave you that, but I still give you another example of say, 
there is Mr. X and Y and X also has a house beside the sea and X's house is destroyed by, uh, you know, by tsunami. So, so now the, 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 now the transaction cannot go further. So this is an example. So where the purpose of the contract is infructuous and there is a super winning impossibility of the contract to be proceeded further because the house is entirely destroyed. So now here you cannot proceed with the contract. Next is discharge by accord and satisfaction or termination by mutual agreement where all the parties get together and say that, well, I don't think we're going to go, go ahead with the contract. So this is termination by mutual agreement. Let us go through it in a little bit detail with case law. Discharge by performance. What is discharge by performance? You have already explained here, but let's go through a little bit detail in this aspect. Okay. Discharge by performance occurs occurs when the parties to the contract accomplish the purpose of the contract and fulfill the obligations as specified in the contract in consonance or in compliance with the terms and conditions of the contract. Then upon such an accomplishment of the purpose of the contract, the contract comes to an end. Thereby, the contract is terminated or automatically it terminates when the object or the purpose of the contract is fulfilled. The question would arise in case of honoring consideration or making payment in case of part performance. Here, the rule of substantial performance would be used to determine whether the party who has substantially performed is part of contract would be entitled under quantum merit, this is a principle, where to a lesser contract price in case of defective performance. Now, the principle of counterclaim or set off, as the case may be, may also come into play. Now, performance vis-a-vis -vis defects will be examined here. Let us explain this with an example. The, in Hoeing versus Isaacs, in this case, what happened was the services of a plaintiff was engaged for interior decoration of the defendant's bedroom. Now. And this guy, they contracted saying that we would pay the, this who wanted his bedroom to be decorated. He asked for the services of an interior decorator and he, they struck a deal for 750 pounds for, you know, furnishing his bedroom and making it beautiful. Now, what happened was later on, this interior decorator did a shabby job and he, he was and the person who contracted uh, the services of the interior decorator was very sad and he was really upset with the entire thing saying that you have not done the job well so when he realized that the materials used also like you know some some of it was cheap material and it was not as they had really transacted and how they really contracted between them like what how the bedroom appearance should be it didn't really happen that way then this person was a little bit annoyed and then he takes the service to someone else and he finishes up the bedroom now here what he says was the cost of rectification for the shabby job done amounted to 55 pounds. So now the matter went up to the court because the other guy was claiming the entire amount of 750. So the court held that the plaintiff has substantially performed the contract and the plaintiff was entitled to receive the balance amount after deducting 55. He said, okay, you are not happy, but you incurred extra expenses. How much did you incur? 55 pounds. Okay, 55 pounds. But now you will have to pay the balance of whatever you contract. You have paid in advance. You pay the balance minus 55 pounds. So here, the, the, the test is that contract has to be substantially performed. And the principle of quantum merit also can be applied here, saying that whatever defective performance is there, you get minus that particular amount, but you have to pay the balance. So under performance, what is to be seen is there can be instances where there is part performance or of a contract and that part performance itself would be substantial enough to entitle the other party to the consideration that has been discussed or to the contract price. Sometimes there can be a counterclaim or a set off. Sometimes it can happen in such cases where uh, you know, set off is a situation where both the parties uh, have equally performed and, uh, you know, they, they would set off whatever, when you quantify it, they would set off the claim. 
Are you understand? There can be a counterclaim saying that, okay, now uh, you have done it, but then I will file again another case against you for counterclaim. That is, if you are claiming something, I would file a counterclaim against the person. So in such cases, the principle of counterclaim or set off as the case may be, may also come into play. And here also under the aspect of performance, what is checked is performance vis-a-vis -vis defects would be examined here. So discharge by performance occurs when the parties to the contract accomplish, they fulfill the purpose of the contract and the obligations are fulfilled. Or in case there is defective performance, then this principle is used. That is uh, where the where, of quantum merit, that means cut out to the, def the defective part of it, you know, minus the, the, you know, you quantify the defective portion and you deduct that particular amount, but you pay the balance consideration. So this is contract by uh, uh, termination by performance. Next is discharge of contract if a substituted agreement is executed. So in such a case, the terms of the contract or even the scope of the contract may be altered and the parties may with consensus add in them that is meeting of minds terminate the contract as I uh, explained earlier, that if they come together and say that let us, uh, you know, let us, uh, uh, execute a new contract and do away with the old one. That is, if there is a substituted agreement and the old one, they terminate it with mutual consent, that is with consensus ad idem. Next is discharge under completion of term. A contract will automatically terminate upon fulfillment of the term of the contract and a relevant clause to that effect will be reflected in the contract. Normally, contracts have a clause such as term and termination clause. Under the term clause, we write that the contract is valid. This is the validity of the contract. The contract is valid for a period of uh, one year from the date of, from the effective date. Now, what is this effective date? Effective date can be the date of execution or effective date is uh, already defined in the contract saying that uh, the contract comes, uh, the, the contract is, uh, you know, comes into existence on dash or say say for example today uh, like you know the 14th of june 2022 so and it would and the term of the contract is one year from the date of effective day that is from 14th of june to the 13th of june next year so 14th of june 2022 to the uh, 13th of june 2023 next year so it depends the the period of contract depends it may vary depending upon the type of contract, what it is, what is the contents in the contract. It could be one year, two year, five years, 10 years, or it could be, you know, it could be perennially going on and until a party terminates the contract. So the term of the contract also is essentially, yeah, so, I mean, it is one of the modes where the contract is terminated or discharged. The contract will automatically terminate upon fulfillment of the terms of the contract. One minute, yeah. Next is termination under operation of law. So discharge by operation of law, for example, a merger of two companies, insolvency, bankruptcy of a party or a new law that is promulgated, which may forbid material term in the contract from being enforced. Next is discharge by frustration or impossibility of performance. Now this occurs where the purpose in the contract is rendered infructuous and it is impossible, impossible to be performed. For example, A agrees to marry B and B dies before the marriage, or A decides to sell his best property, a house by the seashore to B, and the house intended for sale is destroyed by tsunami. So when there is the, uh, the question of supervening impossibility, so performance has not become, one minute, huh? when there is a question of supervening impossibility, Now, now, there are two limitations to the doctrine of frustration. One is performance has not become entirely impossible or that is mere hardship or inconvenience or material loss cannot be construed as or cannot be, uh, you know, considered as impossible to perform in law leading to frustration of the contract. So just simply saying that, no, it's impossible to perform the contract. So the contract is, 
you know, it's rescinded, it's terminated. We cannot say that. There are limitations to that, according to the law, saying that, you know, just saying that it is impossible to perform would not suffice. Simple hardship or mere hardship, inconvenience or material loss cannot be considered as or construed in law as impossibility to perform, leading to frustration of the contract. So this can be explained with a case law. They say that performance has not become entirely impossible. Mere hardship, inconvenience or material alteration cannot be construed as impossible, impossible to perform, leading to frustration of contract. Now, in the case of Secure Glow versus Nobly Toll, the citation is Germany 1962 AC93. In this case, there was a contract for the sale of peanuts or jignuts, you know, peanuts, jignuts or groundnuts to be shipped from Sudan through the Suez Canal to Hamburg, Germany. Now, the canal was closed for navigation and the alternative route was around the Cape of Good Hope, which made the distance four times longer and more expensive. Now, the sellers failed to ship or to you know, transport the goods, claiming that, transport the peanuts, saying that, well, the Suez Canal is closed, so that is the reason I cannot sell, uh, I cannot send the goods to you. So they came up with this uh, defense saying that Suez Canal is closed, and therefore, it has frustrated the contract. It is impossible to perform the contract. But now, you see what the court said. The court held that contract here was not completed, was not impossible to be performed. It was not frustrated just by mere closing of Suez Canal. Goods could be transported even via the Cape of Good Hope. No doubt it was a longer route. It was an expensive route. But fundamentally, it is distinct or it is different as it was still possible to perform the contract without any damage to peanuts because you had an alternative route. So therefore, you cannot simply say Say that contract is impossible to be performed or there is a supervening impossibility that supervening impossibility that contract could not be performed the contract is frustrated so doctrine of frustration of contract for termination cannot be always applied especially if the hardship that has been encountered is hardly a mere hardship or a mere inconvenience or just a material alteration that cannot always be construed as impossible to perform a contract that would lead to frustration of the contract. And this is a classic case of Sakura Glow versus Nobby Toll. Next is self induced frustration. One minute. Okay. No, so next is the uh, if the frustrating event was anticipated and a provision to that extent is made in the contract, then it could not be inferred as frustration of contract. So this is, again, another exception to the doctrine of frustration or to the concept of termination by frustration or termination, uh, you know, by supervening impossibility to perform the contract. One exception, I said that mere hardship would not suffice. Next, I gave you the case law. Next is if the frustrating event was anticipated before and a provision to that extent is already made in the contract. Third is foreseeability or again, you know, where you foresee that it, this is going to happen. So that would again not be considered as, you know, a supervening impossibility because you already, uh, you know, the parties have foreseen the frustrating event. Next is self-induced frustration, where the parties on their own try to frustrate the contract. They do something to put an end to the contract by force. Here the example is the Eugenia's case. Eugenia is a ship and this is the entire citation. Uh, Eugenia 1964 took Queen's Bench 2 to 6. The entire citation is Ocean Tramp Tankers Corporation versus so-and-so. Now in this case, the ship Eugenia was chartered for a trip from Genoa to India via the Black Sea. Now, in the contract, there was a war clause. The war clause said that the charterers are not supposed to enter a dangerous zone. But the charterers, though they were asked not to enter the dangerous zone, they entered the Suez Canal, which was considered so when, when, it, is, when it was such a zone and were trapped in the canal when the war broke out. So the court held that 
the contract here was not frustrated because Eugenia was trapped in the canal. It was foreseen that Suez Canal cannot be operated. There is a war clause there, but Eugenia was trapped in the canal and the charter company was held at fault and the charterers couldn't therefore take the help of self-induced frustration as a defense or couldn't rely on self-induced frustration as a defense. The next mode of termination or discharge of contract is discharge by accord. Accord means, you know, unity of minds, accord and satisfaction. That is by mutual consent. The parties say, well, we cannot perform. We do not want to go ahead with the contract or either the terms of the, the, the term of the, uh, you know, contract, the terms in the contract, the terms and conditions or the covenants in the contract are fulfilled. Or they just say that, no, we do not want to go ahead. We would like to rescind the contract or recall the contract or withdraw the contract. Next is termination in case of breach of contract. Now here, discharge by breach of contract. Now a contract may be terminated when a party to the contract commits a material breach. Material breach is breach that is a significant breach, which would, you know, which would impact the performance of the contract. I'm repeating, material breach is a breach, which is a significant breach that would impact Packed the performance of the contract. So where either the party commits a material breach and such a failure to, to perform a significant contractual obligation, the gravity of which act or commission would attract termination of the contract. The breach may constitute an irreparable breach. That is something which cannot be made good or made right or which cannot be repaired. Further, any act which may be entirely illegal and in contravention of law may be yet another ground for termination. Trespassing the rights of the other party, such as the terms of confidentiality clause, which when breached would also attract the right of the agreed party or the other party in the contract, or whose contractual right is infringed to terminate the contract. So these are some of the examples of how breach would, you know, breach of examples of breach of contract, like, you know, like, um, contravening the confidentiality clause or trespassing the rights of the agreed party. These are some of the examples of breach or where there is a material breach or the party has, is, has not performed his part of contract at all. So these are some of the examples of breach where when the party commits a breach which can be construed as a material breach, material breach is a significant breach which, which impacts the performance of the contract. Okay, now we will learn what is this exact, what is this breach of contract exactly and what are the remedies? We already know that breach of contract can attract termination of the contract. So it is one of the mode or one of the factors which can lead to termination of contract. Termination of contract because of breach of contractual terms. So generally, a breach of contract would have two implications. One is repudiation of the contract, where the person is not willing to perform his part of contract. And two is a breach that may be breach of a material condition or a warranty or an innominate term. Remember, last class we learned what is condition, warranty or an innominate term. An innominate term, if I'm just trying to, uh, you know, remind you or you know, try to trigger your um, your uh, you know, mind and your, you know, your remembering capacity saying that in nominate term is something that has a hue of condition as well as warranty. In nominate term is neither a condition, neither a warranty. Remember? So a breach of, here we are going to learn again, it's a, a little bit repetition about breach of condition, breach of warranty or an in nominate term. So breach can be either repudiation of contract or breach can be breach of condition, warranty or in nominate. Term. So what is repudiation? Repudiation occurs when one party to the contract withdraws himself and is not willing to perform his part of contract, which may be unjustified and amount to an anticipatory breach. And in this case, the other party may terminate the contract or even sue the other party in, a, in the court of law and bring an order for specific performance of contract saying that come, you perform your part of contract. So they can also bring a court order to that extent. Now, breach of condition. What is a condition? Condition constitutes, we learned it during the last class, conditions constitutes 
significant term in the contract and the breach of which may attract repudiation of a contract and or the aggrieved party may sue for damages. Now, breach of warranty. What is warranty? A warranty is a covenant in a contract that when breached, the aggrieved party can call for 